All right, everyone, welcome back. What you're looking at is the Appalachian Mountains. This is right at the corner between Tennessee, Kentucky, and Virginia. Now, right there in the middle of the screen, that's called the Cumberland Gap. And about 300 million years ago, a meteorite crashed through the mountains and left a huge crater on the other side, which you'll see in just a moment. The reason this is so important is because this unit, Unit 6, is all about westward expansion. And not only westward expansion, but how did America go from 13 colonies to 13 states, and then eventually to 48 states, and then finally, obviously, we add Alaska and Hawaii. So right now, you're looking at the impact crater. It's called the Middlesbrough Impact Crater because the city of Middlesbrough was established in the middle. As the camera pans back, you're looking at the gap one more time. Ultimately, this is a shortcut. It allowed settlers, Native Americans, anyone who wanted to go westward, it gave them an opportunity to not have to climb the entirety of the Appalachian Mountains to get from one side to the other. Daniel Boone established what they called the Wilderness Road right through this area. And again, it's very important because it allowed people an easier route to the west. All right, the first thing that many students have trouble with right off the bat is the difference between Manifest Destiny and Monroe Doctrine. Both of the words are a little confusing because they obviously have two words, M, D, etc. So when you encounter any type of test or assessment that has these in it, all you have to do is think. So first off, look at your vocabulary. Destiny. Obviously, destiny is something usually associated with religion, like God wants you to be able to do something. So manifest destiny is the belief that it was America's destiny to stretch from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific. The belief was the key for mass support for territorial expansion. So Americans wanted all the land from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and this led to the removal of Native Americans, and then eventually that leads to the Monroe Doctrine. So America begins as a colony belonging to England. So at this point in history, the leadership does not want England, France, Spain, or any other European power coming over and colonizing in North America because it's our manifest destiny to own all of that land. That leads to the Monroe Doctrine. So first off, who is Monroe? It's James Monroe, an American president. So he issues this rule, this statement that basically says American continents should not be considered for further colonization by European powers. The U.S. will regard as a threat to its own peace and safety any attempt by European powers to interfere. So the United States doesn't want Europe to interfere, not just with North America, but South America as well. They don't want European powers coming to the entire Western Hemisphere. One of the main reasons is that in Europe, they mostly have monarchies, and here in the Western Hemisphere, you're seeing a rise in republics, democracy, etc. Basically, the key concept to this unit is American expansion. How did the United States spread from coast to coast? And what happened because of it? First off, you have conflicts with Native Americans as they are removed from their homelands. This leads to the Trail of Tears, in which many American Indians are literally uprooted from their ancestral homelands, and they died because of lack of food, supplies, and protection. Next, Thomas Jefferson literally doubles the size of the United States by purchasing the Louisiana Territory. So eventually, he enlists the help of Lewis and Clark, and they go out on an expedition to discover what he had actually purchased. That's the crazy thing when you think about it. Millions of acres of land ridiculously cheap were purchased from France, from Napoleon. And ultimately what happens is Lewis and Clark go to explore not only this land, but they keep going further on to the west coast to see if there's a passage of water that can get from the east to the west. They begin in St. Louis, Missouri, and they have a large party with them, and they're looking for any types of animals, contact with Native Americans. It's a really big deal. They discover new plants, animals, etc. 
The other expansion that occurs, for example, after the War of 1812, the Oregon Territory is added. Then we have what's called the Mexican-American War, where California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and parts of Colorado and Nevada are added. And then finally, the acquisition of Texas, which leads to the expansion of slavery. Now, Texas was part of Mexico. Mexico opened the borders and too many Americans came in. So that leads to this war with Mexico between them and Texas. And then eventually, Texas wins its freedom and they become their own separate republic. But then what happens is they basically ask the United States if they can join and it's accepted. That's called an annexation. So that vocabulary gets a lot of people. So Texas was annexed into the United States. We didn't pay money for them. They asked to join and we allowed them. Texas is a big deal because of the expansion of slavery, because the climate. For example, a lot of people are not aware cotton requires over 200 days of no frost in order for it to be a really high quality cotton. So Texas is one of those places in the United States where that can occur. Obviously, cotton grows in other areas as well, but the climate in Texas is perfect for cotton, and thus more slaves are in demand. All right, so I put this map together for the purpose of letting everyone have an easy way to see where did the land come from after those 13 states. So first, if you look over to the east coast or to the right of the map, you see the original 13 states and then the territories past the Appalachian Mountains. They're all represented by a brown star with a blue outline. So that's where we begin. Then we have, in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase by Thomas Jefferson, and that's represented in the middle of the country in the white area, and it has the blue arrow pointing in two different directions. Then we have the annexation of Texas in 1845, and also the same year, the Mexican Cession. So Texas, you can see the blue triangle, and the Mexican session is represented by the right angle triangle. That's kind of gold, brown, green, something along those lines. It's definitely a weird color. I probably should have picked a different one. Then finally, in 1846, you have the Oregon Territory, which we received from England after the War of 1812. So looking at the map, you can see all the different areas and how we came to get them. But then we also have the Alaska Purchase. That doesn't come until 1868. And then 1898 is the annexation of Hawaii. Now down at the middle bottom, it says annexation, a state proclaims sovereignty, which means so when you're sovereign, that means you're like your own nation. So Texas declares independence from Mexico and then the U.S. allows them to join. Now, a cession is a territory that's uh, given or sold. So in the case of the Mexican cession, some were given as part of the war at the end and some we paid for. You don't really have to worry about the specifics too much. The main thing is right here on the map. You need to be aware, how did the United States acquire these different sections of land? So Texas was annexed. They joined willingly after they received their independence from Mexico. The Oregon Territory, due to the War of 1812, etc. So again, not real complicated, but the more you hear it, the more you see it, it'll help you remember. Okay, the Age of Jackson, or as some people refer to it, the Age of the Common Man. This gives a lot of people trouble, so really quickly, Andrew Jackson's the first president of the United States that's not one of the founding fathers. He's the seventh president, and he's uneducated, he's a war hero, and this chart is basically breaking down the different things that you need to know about him. So Jackson gets credit for universal white manhood suffrage increasing the electorate. What that means is before the age of Jackson, only white male landowners could vote. Jackson makes sure that all white males could vote, but there's still no voting for people of color or women. There's also a rise of interest groups, including nativists. So nativists are those supporting the rights of Native Americans. Jackson's treatment of Native Americans was brutal, and that's a big source of criticism today of his presidency. Now, the first six presidents didn't campaign to be president in the way that we would think of that today. But with Jackson, we have the emergence of political campaigning. Campaigning changed to resemble what we have today. Campaigning was considered 
undignified before Jackson's election. And finally, we have the spoils system. Jackson rewarded those that voted for him. Previously, uh, the political part was secondary to the best person for the job. So Jackson literally would reward people because they were in his party, because they voted for him, etc. And that really didn't happen too often beforehand. Next, we have a topic that generally shows up on the SOL, CSAs, benchmarks, etc., and it's not very understood. So sectional tensions leading up to the Civil War. These are the economic issues. First, the North favored high protective tariffs. Think of a tax being charged to someone importing a good. So a tariff is a tax, and the North, they are manufacturing centers. By taxing foreign competition, they believe that they are protecting their business. Just as an example, think of it like this. In the South, they're opposed to high protective tariffs because at that particular time, the South has rich plantation owners. They don't pay for their labor because of slavery. So people in the South might want to buy imports from England, France, Spain, etc. But the North is kind of like, hey, you know, why don't you buy our goods? So if we raise these tariffs, it'll make those products from overseas more expensive and it will encourage the South to purchase from the United States. However, the South wanted freedom. They said, hey, we can buy whatever we want, so we don't want these taxes. So this is an issue between the North and the South. And as we're going to see, there's lots of issues between the North and South. It's almost like they're two separate countries. They're not, but they definitely think differently. The next big issue, also included as a sectional tension, is the expansion of slavery. As new states are entering the Union, so those territories that you saw on the map earlier, they're petitioning to become states. So compromises had to be reached to keep the balance of power between the free states and the slave states. So why is that such a big deal? Because the Southerners felt that if the free states gain an advantage in the legislative branch, slavery will be outlawed. So they wanted to make sure there was an equal number of slave states and free states. Next, we have what's called the Missouri Compromise in 1820. So again, under sectional tensions and the expansion of slavery, there's a line, an east-west line drawn through the Louisiana Purchase. So you can see it on the map. I made it big and blue, so you can see. So the brown states are the slave states. Now, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, they already had slaves before all of this was an issue. So now Maine is coming into the Union, which is way up to the north, and Missouri's coming up to the Union. So both of them are above this line. So the compromise is that Missouri would be a slave state, even though it's above the line. So that's important to understand because that's what the whole compromise is. In order to keep the slave states and the free states equal, Missouri is above the line that they made, but it's going to be made a slave state. So in 1850, we have the Compromise of 1850. So California enters the Union as a free state. Southwestern territories acquired from the Mexican-American War, they get to decide on their own. So you have extremists in both the North and the South. They don't like this decision. In the South, they don't like the idea that states get to decide on their own. They want that balance of power. They want an equal number of free states and slave states, whereas the northern states just want no more slavery. They're tired of slavery expanding. So in 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is passed. It repeals the Missouri Compromise Line and gave people a choice on slavery in Kansas and Nebraska. This is called popular sovereignty. Bloody fighting in Kansas between pro and anti-slavery forces happens and it leads to the birth of Abraham Lincoln's Republican Party to oppose slavery. So in 1832, we have what's called the nullification crisis in South Carolina. So what happens is South Carolina argues that sovereign states could nullify acts of Congress. What they're saying is if Congress passes a tax or a tariff, that a state can literally say, no, we're not doing that because we're a state. We have that power. What's happening here is South Carolina is pushing the envelope by basically saying that states should be able to leave the union to leave the United States if they are not able to have their own sovereign power. 
Ultimately, President Jackson threatened to send federal troops and collect the tariff revenues, the taxes, and uphold the power of the federal law. So we know the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. I don't know why anybody would argue that a state has more power or could invalidate those acts. So slave revolts in Virginia cause a lot of fear. In 1800, you have Gabriel, or some people call him Gabe Prosser, but Prosser is the surname of his slaveholder. And in 1831, Nat Turner's rebellion. The slave revolts basically caused white Southerners to fear that slaves were going to rise up and overthrow them. Because of this fear, it starts restricting the rights of free blacks as well. So it has severe consequences. Next up, we have William Lloyd Garrison, who's an abolitionist. He comes up with a newspaper that's weekly, and he's arguing against slavery due to his Christian principles. So more and more people in the South are becoming alarmed at the rising number of abolitionists in the North. However, the reality is it's still a small number of people, I believe around 2%, that are abolitionists compared to the rest of the population. Now we have the Underground Railroad. I'm sure most people have heard of that, but the big thing is how did it cause tension? Literally, we have the Fugitive Slave Act and Northerners are not abiding by that. And the Southerners are becoming outraged because they want their slaves freed, whereas you have a lot of abolitionists who are assisting the slaves in escaping. So this brings us to finally the causes of the Civil War. And I want to just say this as a disclaimer. This is a review video to pass your SOL, your CSAs, etc. So this is based on what's in the curriculum. So we have sectional disagreements and debates over tariffs, the extension of slavery into the territories, and the nature of the union, which is states' rights. You also have issues related to slavery increasingly dividing the nation and leading to the Civil War. Much of America's economy revolved around the institution of slavery, which accounted for a large share of America's exports. You have Northern abolitionists versus Southern defenders of slavery. You have a series of failed compromises over the expansion of slavery in the territories and the Fugitive Slave Act. You have the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe in response to the Fugitive Slave Act. And last we have the United States Supreme Court decision in the Dred Scott case. Really briefly, in case you're not really familiar or didn't understand, as I find a lot of students have a hard time understanding what this is all about, Dred Scott's a, a slave and his owner takes him into a free state where slavery doesn't exist. So his argument is that he should be free because there is no slavery and he was taken to this free state. So what happens is this case goes all the way to the Supreme Court and he is not given freedom. Now there's lots more to it. It's very negative, but again, that's the basis of it. By the mid 1850s, we have the creation of Abraham Lincoln's Republican Party, and they're devoted to stopping the spread of slavery in the territories. Now, why do I keep saying Abraham Lincoln's Republican Party? Because if you remember, you learned earlier, Thomas Jefferson's political party is now referred to as the Democratic Republicans, but they refer to themselves as the Republicans. So just to make sure that we can separate the two. 